Mike, let's talk about boards. In your 1993 address, you talk about internal and external uh, control systems and outline the steps boards need to take to avoid repeated failures. Have they heeded your call? I think we've seen considerable progress in, um, in governance systems and boards of directors. Uh, again, I'm not intimately involved in that, so I haven't been studying it lately, but there's been a substantial move, even in the United States now, to separate this, the position of CEO from the position of chairman of the board. Oftentimes now it's called the lead director. Um, that was one of the more important things that uh, should be changed or had to be changed if we wanted to get uh, board systems that run better. It doesn't guarantee it will run better, but the, the essential argument is pretty obvious that a very important part of board's function is to monitor, evaluate, hire, fire um, the CEO, and the CEO cannot possibly do an effective job of running that process for himself. I don't care who you are. And, um, and over the last 10 or 20 years, I think we've seen considerable movement in the in the UK, it's almost universal that the CEO is not the chairman of the board. Interesting, in the UK, uh, there's an attitude amongst board members that I get that they take the monitoring and control function way more serious than do US directors. There's still a, a, a very serious problem in US boards. I think it's changing in that uh, directors approach their job with the implicit uh, worldview frame of reference that their job is to support the CEO uh, primarily. And if you can't support the CEO, you should leave the board. Um, now that uh, has obvious problems associated uh, with it. You don't want boards of directors who are constantly battling with the CEO. So supporting is not a, a ridiculous notion, but their primary job, one of the primary jobs of the board is to hire, fire, and compensate the CEO. And if you're doing that, you can't do that with a mindset that says, I need to support the CEO, and if I can't, I should resign. And that's still uh, uh, the social attitude that tends to prevail, I believe, in CEO boards. Now that will, that collapses once a company gets in trouble. Then boards will switch immediately if there's a crisis, especially if it's going to uh, bear on their reputation into the monitoring and control mode and uh, take that whole end of it seriously. But meanwhile, that's way too late to have had uh, this process uh, finally become effective. It should, have, it should have gone on way earlier. But we're moving in the right direction, and we're a long way from the clubby atmosphere that we used to have in the 60s, 70s, and even the 80s. You know, I was talking about your 1993 address, but it strikes me that this is uh, exactly what uh, you and Eugene Fama were talking about in, in a couple of uh, influential articles. Oh, right. <laughs> I forgot about those. So if you're giving advice to boards today, are you, um, are you telling them different things that you, you've and you would have said a decade ago, two decades ago? Um, I don't get asked to give advice to boards of directors. <laughs> That's probably not surprising if the CEO is playing a major role. But it's been, uh, and I can't claim uh, to be cause in what's happened, but it's nice to see the environment evolving in a way that's consistent with what the pure logic and economics of the argument uh, implied, you know, decades ago that ought to happen. Mike, what would your role, uh, what would your view of uh, Sarbanes-Oxley be and the role it's played in corporate governance? I think Sarbanes-Oxley is actually, first of all, I haven't studied it carefully as I'm off doing other things, but well, Sarbanes-Oxley had some good aspects of it. Um, one of the best was uh, in, 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 inadvertently by requiring 
that uh, option awards be announced in something like 24 or 48 hours, they've made it impossible uh, for people to backdate options, which was a serious abuse of the powers of the board. Nothing wrong with backdating options. What's wrong is when you backdate options and pretend that you didn't, so you're basically lying to the shareholders and various other parties. On the other hand, uh, what I do see from those who have paid careful attention uh, to what's going on, the arguments are that Sox has imposed large uh, inefficiencies on boards and, and transactions costs using that old language, and um, I'm too distant to tell whether the benefits have um, exceeded the costs. I do remember I was in a panel in Switzerland uh, with a couple of uh, chairmen of boards of directors from very large companies, and um, they, they happened to say, these are off the record, so I can't name the companies or the, or the people, that they thought SOX had brought about, these were American companies that came under SOX, had brought about major increases in efficiency uh, as a result of their requirements to, that they needed to satisfy about control systems. Increases. Increases, increases. in efficiency. <clears throat> Now, it's not unusual that those people who are involved and benefit from the inefficiencies be um, complaining loudly about the costs of imposing these regulations that are taking away their toys. Um, I don't know where it comes out yet. Now, there's certainly been some good things from it, whether the bad things, you know, I'm nervous when we start mandating too much detail um, from the government and these things, because it's bound and determined to generate inefficiencies. Um, but certainly, things like requiring the announcement of stock awards uh, very shortly after they're made, or, or option awards, can't be very costly, and it's generated some substantial benefits. A lot of people view the recent financial crisis as a result of board failure. Would that be your view? And are there things that you think they should have done to have um, recognized the crisis sooner? I don't think we yet understand uh, as well as we need to the causes of the recent financial crisis. Um, Later on, if we get to talking about integrity, I'll draw a comparison to this, but I think this may be the wrong time to go into that. But um, the, let me say the following. I believe that when we sort out what the uh, real causes were of this uh, very unfortunate experience that we're going through, we're going to find out that much less of it came about as a result of agency costs, came about because of the conflicts of interest between principal and agent, partners, whatever. And um, the reason I say that is because you, one can think of the board as responsible to make sure that it um, keeps people from getting off the reservation as a result of their own self-interest. I believe what we're going to find out is that a very large fraction of the costs that have been imposed uh, from this latest series of events is going to turn out to be the result of people, individuals, making decisions and taking actions that were not in their own best interest. So that's, they're not the agency problem. I'm going to talk about something else now. Uh, they were, you can think about it as an agency problem, if you like, uh, as an agency problem with themselves. They're, 
we as human beings regularly take actions that hurt ourselves, hurt our loved ones, and hurt our companies. And in this case, I believe a large part of what happened is going to turn out to be from actions like that, where people weren't benefiting themselves at the expense of others. And I'm not saying that didn't happen. It surely did. But people were making mistakes that hurt themselves and in the process hurt their firms and hurt, and hurt others. And as long as we continue to look at it in the, in the standard way that lay behind your question, we will never see the real causes. Um, for example, there's a great brouhaha about bonuses uh, going on. You cannot find the seeds of the crisis in the financial markets in the pay systems uh, for the investment banking, investment bankers. At least if you're, what's available in the public uh, or for the name partners, supposedly, the, uh, and uh, the name managing directors. And those compensation look, systems look about as good as I can imagine. Uh, very small salaries on the order of four or $500,000 a year. Most all of the payments come in the form of, of uh, so-called bonuses. Uh, that in, easily amount to the millions or even tens of millions of dollars. Roughly 80% of those um, in the firms that Kevin and Murphy and I looked at require that uh, roughly 70 or 80% of those bonuses be taken in the form of restricted stock. This year Goldman Sachs has made it 100% uh, of the bonus comes in restricted stock. And that restricted stock often can't be sold without permission of, of the firm or can't be sold until retirement. And even then, there are some restrictions and penalties that hold on. Now, we don't know, I don't know much about the compensation of people below the top 20, 30, or 40 named partners. But you can't find the source of the, in spite of the arguments that are being made by, in the political sector cannot find the source of that crisis in the pay packages of the top level executives. I mean, there's a real problem involved. Kevin and I are writing this in our long overdue forthcoming book on executive compensation that um, there's a vast misunderstanding of the word bonuses. And we're seeing it in action right now in the political sector and there will be substantial negative outcomes that result from it. So what am I talking about in terms of a misunderstanding? It is, so <clears throat> let's suppose the managing directors of these organizations were paid as a typical, on a typical sales commission. So there wasn't the $400,000 base salary, which is not, not even enough to pay the tax, anywhere is near to pay the taxes on these stock awards. Nobody would say that somebody who's a, a sales representative who gets 5% of sales and no, no guaranteed draw, nobody would say that that salesman's total earnings were a bonus. Bonus suggests something else. The word bonus suggests that the regular compensation, the fixed compensation, is, some, is somehow the competitive compensation, the expected compensation. It's what you normally go to work for. And the bonus is something you get on top of that for exceptionally good performance. Now, that is a stupid way to write a compensation plan that's variable. Kevin and I and others have argued that you don't want kinks in the compensation plan like that. You'd like to have it linear all the way back to zero, which would be the pure sales compensation. Most of the compensation that investment bankers earn, at least these top 20, 30, or 40 people of the name partners, comes much in the form of a sales commission. It's not on sales, it's a fraction of the value created, the profits of the firm. Now, there are, there are problems with that, but it, that's an in, compared to lots of other alternatives, that's a very good system. And yet now, I would 
I would predict if you were to create the right kind of poll, you would find that 95% of the people in, the, in this country, and probably true in Europe, think that the bonus for an investment banker uh, that can amount to 10, 20, even $50 million is not something that's a major part of which is their expected competitive compensation, but it's extra on top of an already high salary. And that leads to the insanity that we're seeing taking place with Ken Feinberg, uh, the Pazar, and the restrictions on compensation. He is, if it were to continue for very long, he will single-handedly destroy, um, through those regulations, uh, the financial firms uh, in this country that we'd like to have around. And I'm not saying, I'm no great fans of, of these firms. I have lots of bad things to say about Goldman Sachs and what they've regularly done to their clients and the lack of integrity in that organization. So I don't have sympathy for them from that standpoint. But uh, let's take AIG. Do we really want to, the people who created, my understanding is the problems that got AIG into difficulty are gone. We're now in the business of basically driving the people who are around to bail them out of the hole they got themselves into, and that's going to take a lot of talented people. Ken Feinberg and company are in the process of driving those out of the firm. That will guarantee that there will be taxpayer losses um, and uh, rather than gains. The longer they stay there, and it looks like they're pretty much locked in. Uh, so we're seeing a veritable uh, disaster taking place that's highly popular in the political sector. And, you know, because a man, average man and woman in the street, even very sophisticated ones, have no idea of the complexity of what's going on here. And they have no idea of the fact that these people can go, these highly talented people can go off and start their own hedge funds, they can start their own money management firms, they can go to work for others, and they're leaving by the thousands the very people that are necessary to, to bring these organizations out of the hole. They're leaving, not only because the, some of the firms are in bad shape, but now they've got this extraneous set of regulations that limit uh, these companies from rewarding the very valuable people that's necessary to get them out of the hole. Now, I understand that that's an ugly thing to deal with, but, uh, you know, we've we started out by shooting ourselves in the foot. We're now starting to shoot ourselves in the ankle and headed for the knee and, and the hip. Uh, how far down that road do we want to go uh, without actually, in order to please uh, people on Main Street who don't and can't, from where they are, possibly understand the complexity of the issues that are being dealt with? I'm not a politician, and there's a good reason why. But this is not a good system. We're not going through a good time. And a very large part of it, a very large part of it is motivated by one of the least attractive aspects of human beings. And it is envy and jealousy. That if you get more than I, there must be something wrong with you. That's inappropriate. Years ago, I created one of the things I call Jensen's Laws. And the, and the law is, this was number one, people systematically, I believe, if you, if you probe them, will think everybody's got a number, a sort of range in mind about what nobody's worth more than that. And that number will tend to be about three times what their current income is. That they can't imagine that anybody would appropriately receive roughly three times more than what I'm receiving now. And that's just a fact of life. Uh, it's clearly too simple, but something like that exists. And so then you'll see, read the blogs, read the comments. You know, the, you have people who are passionate about the fact that nobody could possibly be worth more than that, and they ought to get off their high horse, and they're not recognizing that they can walk down the street and go to work for 
two, five, ten million dollars, and Ken Feinberg is saying, you know, you can't be paid more than five hundred thousand dollars, and and what's the current current uh, limit on stock, salarized stock, which is on the order of three or four times, whatever that is. Mike, suppose you were appointed Pazar. What would you do differently? Well, I wouldn't do that. That's the first thing I wouldn't do. Uh, you know, uh, from what I've seen of the invest top level compensation programs of the investment banks, I wouldn't do anything. Uh, I can't tell you about the commercial banking sector because I haven't seen the data. Um, they're about as good as I can imagine a, a compensation system being designed, and I'm, you know, we could nitpick about a lot of things. Uh, the fact of the matter is, at that level, um, you know, Renee Stoltz has a paper, and Kevin and I have been looking at the numbers. The, the top-level investment bankers in, on Wall Street have suffered enormous losses huge losses in billions of dollars. And, uh, and if they were being sensible, they would never have put their firms in the position of taking the risks that would result in those things. They gotta explain it, I believe, by people taking actions that were not in their own self-interest. And that's in this world of behavioral phenomenon uh, and we don't fully understand that yet and won't for a while until we look at the, and we look at the data and the phenomenon better. And we're going to talk more about that as we go along, uh, but um, the source of a large part of this, uh, well, I'll just say this and we'll come back to it later, was the systems evolved in a way that they lacked integrity and the result was the losses of trillions of dollars. Now, expanding on that means we've got to talk about what integrity is, and that's another set of work, and I know we're going to come to it later, so let's just leave that as a, as a um, holding point. Well, I, Mike, I think this will relate to it, too, um, and so we can defer this uh, for a little bit, if, if you like, but we've all had the pleasure of the ancient curse of living in interesting times the past few years, uh, where did we go wrong? And what do we do to need to do to strengthen the private sector to get back on track? Well, one of the things that will make a big difference is uh, to get organizations and people to understand the importance of integrity. Um, we evolved a system in the subprime mortgage market which was absolutely out of integrity. We ended up having systems evolve in which people got paid for writing and issuing mortgages rather than getting paid for writing and issuing mortgages that would be repaid. And sort of that's, you might say, well, how in the world that, could that possibly happen? Well, it did. And, um, and you, if you look in the investment banking sector, the people who were doing this were eating their own lunch. They were putting huge billions of dollars worth of these no good assets on their balance sheets at the same time that they were creating them and selling them in the, in the market. Now, the one organization that didn't do that was Goldman Sachs. And if the Goldman Sachs coverage, pardon me, the Wall Street Journal coverage of the Goldman Sachs situation is true, it says a lot about the lack of integrity in that organization. The Wall Street Journal pointed out that <clears throat> Goldman Sachs was a major player in creating these collateralized debt obligations of subprime mortgages and others and marketing them to their clients. At some point, a small group of people, apparently on the order of 10, in the back room decided these things were dramatically overvalued and were shorting them. And apparently twice, the 
integrity issue got raised as to whether it was appropriate for the firm to continue to create these things and sell them out the front door and effectively in effect giving their word to the clients, to the buyers, that they were worth what they were paying. At the same time, you had a group of people, a small group of people in the back room selling them short because they believed they were overvalued. The astounding thing, if it's true, the Wall Street Journal said this, I don't know whether it's true, was that twice this went to the CEO of Goldman Sachs' office, and twice it was ruled that it was fine to engage in both of these operations at the same time. That's lack of integrity. And it wasn't by accident that when the subprime crisis, subprime crisis hit, I've forgotten the numbers, but Goldman, amongst all the investment banks who were, who were hemorrhaging losses, Goldman showed something like a $4 billion or an $8 billion quarterly profit. And they claimed it was from hedging. Now, you don't show a $4 or $8 billion profit from hedging. That's called speculation. Was your work on overvalued equity the impetus to uh, explore integrity? Well, let me think about that for a moment. No. Um, I got involved in looking at this issue of integrity um, as a result of uh, the exposure that I'd had to some very innovative ideas and ways of thinking that comes from uh, ontology, the study or science of being, um, which I'd never heard of before, uh, not the part of ontology that concerns itself with whether God exists or not, uh, as Hilary Putnam, the ontotheological path. And um, in creating this leadership course, um, after I retired from um, when emeritus at Harvard, uh, I got exposed to these ideas of integrity from my co-author Steve Zafron and Werner Erhard. And uh, as I began to look at it, I thought, you know, that was profound. Uh, and has an enormous impact on human behavior and organizational behavior if people come to understand this con concept of integrity, not in the way it's normally thought about, but in a purely positive way that has nothing inherently good or bad about it. And, uh, and when I saw that and I began to see its impact on organizations and, and individual human beings' lives, I realized that it was an opening to a source of productivity that is gigantic. And what do I mean by that? In terms of organizational performance, uh, easily 100 to 500% increase in productivity as a result of getting people to understand this positive theory of integrity. Now that's gigantic. You know, people normally think if you can get a 20% increase in productivity from some new strategy or a new plan that it, it uh, has a huge impact. We've seen at SSRN, my little laboratory, um, for which I'm the chairman and now the chief integrity officer, uh, chief and check the integrity czar, pardon me. We've seen over a year and a half period uh, something like a 350% increase in productivity and the, and the people are happier. Um, so when the Goldmans behave with lack of integrity, they pay a cost in the long run. And it's widely discussed how Goldman regularly um, exploits their clients. And um, I don't know the details of that, but it'll be interesting for somebody in finance to take a careful look at that. Mike, I don't know if we have the time to fully grasp uh, the answer to this question, but it strikes me that you're, you make a distinction in your work between knowing and being. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, this is this um, 
recent work that I've been involved in for the last, uh, well, go back to the beginning for the last dozen years, but more intensively in the last six or seven years. Um, this is a big failure in what we do as teachers, um, not understanding this distinction. To make it sound fancy, you can talk about the epistemological view versus the ontological view of the world. The epistemological view has to do with knowing about things. The ontological view of the world has to do with being something, like being a person of integrity or being productive or simple-minded is being angry. Now, if you're being angry, you're likely to act in anger. Um, and uh, so an easy way to, um, let me see if I can think of an easy way to illustrate this. Well, it is the following. Um, we spend way too little time in business programs both at Rochester when I was there and at the Harvard Business School up through the time that I retired in 2000. Way too little time giving our students and our, whether they're executives or MBA students or doctoral students, access to something. I learned this from Chris Argerus, wrote a book on actionable research. What does it mean to give somebody access to something? It's very different than giving them some knowledge of something. So I could have knowledge of something and be able to talk about it in a, in a uh, lucid way, in a persuasive way, but have no access to actually creating it or doing it. Uh, we can talk about leadership, for example, and we can know about leadership. That's totally different than having access to leadership. Access to leadership means that you have an actionable pathway to being a leader and the effective exercise of leadership. Or in the case of integrity, you have an actionable pathway that will give you access to being a company of, of integrity or a person of integrity. That's very different than being able to talk about integrity and know about integrity. So um, that's an area where uh, we in business education, but education in general, um, needs to spend a lot more time thinking about, uh, you know, and as Chris Arger put it, you know, we gin up terms, we create models, we create evidence, and you know, you can point to something as good, but where, the, where our failure begins to open up is if we start asking ourselves and asking each other, what are we doing in the classroom or in our papers that will provide students or readers with an actionable pathway to accomplish what we're teaching them about? That's a very different question than knowing about it. And if we get around to talking about it, he was going to say, in, in, um, with a matter of integrity, my co-authors and I can provide an actionable pathway, step by step. If you do this, this, and that, you will be a person of integrity and you get the rewards that come from being that. That's different than what goes on in most of the ethics and values-oriented courses in business schools and in universities, which talk about being a good person, making the right decisions. Well, at, at that level, that's pretty empty. Now, I know that's something that's not part of the academic discourse in most business schools and we're in the economics profession, but it's very, very important. Theory, governance, and compensation, how do these areas relate to integrity and to leadership? Let me deal with um, let me deal with the agency argument for a moment. Um, that framework model of human behavior and organizations causes us to look at 
the phenomenon that's going on in those organizations through this lens of what I'm going to say is conflicts of interest, self-interested human beings or self-interested divisions uh, interacting with each other, whether it's at the family level or at an organizational level, in which individuals see that they can benefit themselves, but that harms their partners in some cases. Um, and then that creates a way to look at control systems and compensation systems and governance systems that um, with, is designed, and if you get people to understand it, then they see how by cooperating to limit their own um, inconsistent behavior, um, inconsistent with the goals of the organization as a whole, uh, by taking inappropriate fringe benefits, by loafing, you know, all of the kinds of things we talk about in terms of ways that an agent can exploit the principle. And what we see is that if you get people to see that framework, then they can begin to see how it pays them to create an optimal set of contracts, be they formal or informal, an optimal set of organizational arrangements that limits this counterproductive uh, behavior by agents or cooperating partners. Now what that misses is extremely important. What it misses, and the behavioralists have been for the last couple of decades working away at documenting some of this, is that if you look at human behavior, any individual, and if you look at it outside of the vision that's provided by e e economics, what we're going to see is people systematically, everybody, there's nobody that's immune from this, systematically take actions that hurt themselves, hurt their loved ones, and hurt their companies, and refuse to learn about it. As I said before, you can think about that as an agency problem with oneself. I think it was Richard Thaler. Uh, you can edit some of that out. Richard Taylor said long ago, you can think about this as an agency problem with oneself. Now, as I mentioned earlier, what happens is, and this is a puzzle to us economists, what happens is we systematically take actions that hurt us, and then the fallout from that very often is we hurt those around us, and aren't, including our companies. If we insist on looking at those sets of problems through the lens of agency theory, which is focused on the notion that people don't do that, they're always acting in their own self-interest, we will never get to the source of those problems. And, if, and what's going on in the world right now over this crisis, it's being looked at in the context of conflicts of interest between people, between agents. The, the unstated thinking is somebody, lots of somebodies, are making themselves better off at the expense of lots of other people. And I'm not saying that doesn't happen. It does happen. But there are equally many cases where people are hurting themselves, putting themselves in poverty, breaking up their families, ruining their companies because of mistakes that they're, made, that they're making, hurting themselves, not benefiting themselves, and it's simultaneously hurting those around them. Now, if we're stuck in looking at the problem solely through the agency lens, we will never get a handle on this source of problems. And I'm saying now that I believe this, sort of, this source of problems Call it non-rational behavior. Call it agency problems with oneself. Is at least as large as what we normally think about. At least as large in the world as agency problems between people. So if I were to give a, a way of thinking about this where I see now and how I would integrate this work 
And by the way, it relates to this integrity issue that you raised, because when one is out of integrity, we think we are benefiting ourselves. And almost all human beings are. That's a longer conversation. We're actually harming ourselves and refusing to face up to it. Now, what I would claim now is that the order of magnitude of these things are roughly as follows. The costs that are imposed on individuals and society and firms from agency problems, conflicts of interest between people, are about the same size as the cost imposed on individuals, families, and firms from behavior that hurts themselves. I think the magnitude of those two things in the world is roughly equal. And it probably amounts to something like 50% of the total inefficiencies and problems that exist. Now, I know if you ask me how I could measure that, I can't. I'm just trying to give you a feeling for the magnitude of the field or the problem area. So what are the other 50% consist of? Well, simple-mindedly, I'd say that another 25% of the problems that exist in business and in the world have to do with misallocating decision rights. And what do I mean by that? Ideally, if we had a perfect world, we would locate decision rights, the right to initiate, take actions, monitor, in the hands of those agents, those individuals, or those units, if we're thinking about companies, or if we're thinking about governments, those places in the government, where the people we're going to allocate those decision rights to the people who have the very best information relevant to the exercise of those decision rights. That's a very difficult problem to solve. That's the Fama Jensen structure. I've forgotten the language or where it came from. It it's, um, comes out of the work with Bill Meckling originally, okay. and I think Gene and I made use of it. Uh, it's a... It's a source of problems that is generally ignored, at least formally, by economists and, and, um, and business school researchers, but it's very, very important. And it's, the heart, it's at the heart of, here it's not ignored, but here it's at the heart of the debate between the appropriate role of government and the appropriate role of private enterprise. And I'm not going to go into a whole deal about discussing those sets of issues. So if that amounts to 75% of the of what we see is the inefficiencies and the problems in the world, where, where do the other 25% come from? I don't know. But I guarantee you there are sources we don't know. And we don't know that we don't know it. So I'm calling attention to what I believe is at least 25% of the problem, problems that we exist in, that exist in the world and we don't know, that we don't know what the source of those problems are. Thanks, Mike.